Okay, we're in 1 Kings chapter 11 this morning. Nice to see everybody. Welcome. And this is the last in Kings for a little while. Then we're going to go into Luke's gospel for the next number of weeks. Now, 1 Kings chapter 11 is well timed to be near Halloween, as it's one of the scariest chapters in the Bible. And it should be one of our greatest fears as Christians to finish our life like Solomon. The wisest man in the world became an old fool. So let's read 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 to 8. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, You shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines, or girlfriends. And his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not wholly follow the Lord, as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives, who have made offerings and sacrifice to their gods. Now we must remember that Solomon certainly wasn't stupid. His request for wisdom, do you remember back in chapter 3 of 1 Kings, it actually delighted the Lord to give him wisdom. And he gave him so much wisdom that Solomon gained a reputation for wisdom amongst even the other nations. And people like the Queen of Sheba came for miles to ask him questions. So it's hard to believe that he ends his life doing something so dumb. Serving other gods, like non-existing idols. And the writer here calls them abominations, perverse religions that encourage sexual immorality, even child sacrifice. And it it says that Solomon went after these gods. So he wasn't passive in it. He even built temples in their honor. It's hard to believe, and it should scare us all. How could someone so smart become so stupid at the end of his life? Solomon knew these gods were nonsense. He knew there was only one transcendent Lord of the universe. You read his prayer in 1 Kings chapter 8, and the man knows there is only one God. So what is he doing? Building temples for this other nonsense. His heart made him do what his head knew was ridiculous. And this chapter is a really good wake-up call for me. One of our strong points here in Apsley is knowledge of the Word of God. And it's not any credit to us. We were handed a good heritage from those who came before us. And just like Solomon is handed a magnificent kingdom by his father. And because of this, it's easy to assume that we won't do anything too stupid, right? Because we know the Word of God. We know better. We know it's madness, you know, to cheat on our spouses or start getting into debt through gambling or overspending. But Solomon shows us that no matter how much we know, we are still capable of making the most stupid decisions. I want to to show you a verse from the Apostle Paul. This is the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. See how much Paul does not trust himself, right? This is the Apostle Paul. 
He knows how capable he is of evil, and he has a healthy fear of it. And in his old age, Solomon let himself go, not in the waistline. He indulged his sexual appetite with an addiction to pretty women. And everything Solomon did was extravagant, as we know from the previous chapters, and that included his harem. It's, it's a wife collection of, of kings. They collected wives in those days, and he collected 700 princesses and 300 concubines. It, it sounds implausible, right? How could any man sustain a thousand relationships but these were not normal marriages. This was all show. This was like Hugh Hefner and his Playboy bunnies, if you know that, the Playboy Mansion. These pretty ladies made Solomon look great, and they were happy to pose, you know, alongside the old man for the sake of the lifestyle that came with it. And notice it says they were princesses. It means they were from noble, influential families, so it had the extra benefit to Solomon of creating alliances between the most powerful families and, and the other kingdoms nearby. It helped Solomon keep his kingdom peaceful because nobody was going to attack Solomon whenever one of their daughters was one of his wives. You see, so it, it made friends. And not to mention all the generous diaries that he got through all of this, you know, what started when Solomon married Pharaoh's daughter soon became a strategy and maybe even an addiction, and it ended up reaching ridiculous proportions. And we've seen the same thing happen too many times. You, something starts off small, becomes an addiction, gets out of control. And the Christian speaker, Ravi Zacharias, you may be well aware of, he had a wonderful ministry, a wonderful knowledge of the Bible, Yet he ended up exploiting many women, wrecked his testimony and his ministry. I, I, I have known good husbands and fathers. They, they seem like solid pillars of the church. And then out of the blue, they seem to lose the run of themselves and leave their wives and families. And it's, it brings a real shame on God and his church. Think of the impact that this had on the nation of Israel and the surrounding nations. Solomon had a, had a magnificent reputation for wisdom, and now he's running after these non-existent idols. And he's even building temples for them on the Mount of Olives, just outside Jerusalem. It, it kind of took away from the unique glory of the Lord and the temple that he had built for God, didn't it? This was undermining everything that he had achieved. The temple no longer stood as a unique witness to the one true God because there was all these other temples going up everywhere. We should be all properly scared of ever being the cause of such damage to the cause of Christ. But it, but it didn't come out of nowhere. It never does. This came from years of disobedience. You see, the Lord had clearly warned him of the danger of entering into marriage with foreign women. The Lord said, if you do that, God said, you, you will end up worshiping their gods. Now, Solomon must not have believed the warning. But it is exactly what happened to him. And this is why, once again, it's so important for Christians to marry other believers who have a heart for the Lord. Not just a believer, but someone who has a heart for the Lord. Because the most important thing in any spouse is someone who will encourage you to put the Lord above themselves. Right? To actually put the Lord ahead of them. Encourage you to do that. I am so thankful that there are so many marriages, even here in Apsley, where the joint priority of the marriage is to serve the Lord. And there's many evenings, there's wives and husbands are putting their children to bed alone as their spouse can get out to hear the word of God and to serve the Lord. But you just imagine a young man who loves the Lord, he loves the word of God, he studies it often in the evenings, and then he falls in love and he gets married, and his wife has no real interest in serving the Lord. She wants to cuddle up every night 
watch TV together in front of the fire. You know, of course, he will give in most nights to keep her happy. You come back in three years and he won't love the Bible like he used to. He will love the same TV shows that his wife does. That's the way it goes. <laughs> this is just an example. It's not about watching TV. There is the opposing danger, of course, of neglecting family responsibilities. But we need to be honest about the influence we're having on those that we're closest to. Solomon was the king. He was meant to encourage obedience to the Lord. But his wives had no interest in obeying the Lord. They did not even know the Lord. And they gradually turned his heart away from the Lord. And you might not have known it to look at him for years. You know, for many years, he still led the nation in their worship of Jehovah. If you go back to chapter 9, verse 25, it says three times a year, Solomon goes up to the temple. He offers burnt offerings and peace offerings. And maybe people just watched the king do this. They never knew how compromised he was becoming until the day he ordered his own men to build, start building a temple for the god Chemosh. His wife from Moab had been nagging him for it for years. Unaware, she was actually sowing the seeds of her own husband's downfall. And it's in our closest relationships that, that we have the greatest impact. And let us all be careful to put, never to put ourselves between our spouse, our, our friends, our family members, our children, our parents, between them and God, right? We should never come between them and God. We should, we should be encouraging those we love to love and obey God more than they please us. And it says in verse 9 that the Lord was angry. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. So of course the Lord was angry. This was sheer disobedience. Solomon had persistently chosen to please his wives ahead of pleasing the Lord. So God started to actually work against Solomon. Up until now, everything Solomon touched had turned to gold because God was with him. God was for him. Now God turns against him. And he raises up three enemies against Solomon. Before this, Solomon's kingdom had no enemy. It was, it was all peace and prosperity. It was all sweetness and light. It was all gold and glitter. And Solomon was not a warrior. His very name means peaceful. Solomon, you know, shalom, peace, Solomon. But now for the first time, there's enemies on his border. And verses 14 to 22 in this chapter describes Hadad in the southeast in Edom. And then verses 23 to 25 describes Rezin in the north in Syria and Damascus. And the biggest section, verse 26 to 39, describes a young man called Jeroboam who rises up against Solomon within his own kingdom. An insider. He was actually a nobody. He was a widow's son until Solomon himself noticed the young man's potential and gave him responsibility and opportunity. And in the next chapter, that young man that Solomon trained up will actually take away most of Solomon's kingdom from himself, 10 of the 12 tribes. And the Lord was behind it all. Look, in verse 14, it says, The Lord raised up Hadad. 
In verse 23, it says, God also raised up another adversary, Rezon. And in verse 31, God actually sends a prophet called Ahijah to Jeroboam, the third guy. And Ahijah rips his cloak into 12 pieces and he gives Jeroboam 10 of the 12 pieces as a dramatic way of telling him that God is going to take 10 of Solomon's tribes and give them to you to reign over them, to be king over most of the nation. And, and even more remarkably, in the next few verses, God actually offers to establish Jeroboam's house and dynasty, just like David's. If Jeroboam is willing to be loyal to God, just like David, the prophet Ahijah says this to Jeroboam, I will take you, this is God speaking to Jeroboam, and I will take you, and you shall reign over all that your soul desires, and you shall be king over Israel. And if you will listen to all that I command you, you will walk in my ways and do what is right in my eyes by keeping my statutes and my commandments as David my servant did. I will be with you and will build you a sure house as I built for David. And I will give Israel to you and I will afflict the offspring of David because of this, but not forever. Isn't that an amazing offer that God makes to Jeroboam? You see, God has moved on. He is now against Solomon, and he is offering to be with Jeroboam. Do you notice that? I will be with you. And the last thing we read about Solomon doing in the whole of his glorious life is he's trying to kill Jeroboam. But he is foiled. Jeroboam escapes to Egypt, just like the young Jesus, whenever jealous King Herod tried to kill him. How the tables had turned. But this is mercy. You know, God won't let Solomon or any of us head down this road of disobedience without resistance. And if we get a sense that life is no longer going our way, perhaps God is trying to show us that our hearts have drifted from building his kingdom to building our own. When our priority is obedience, God is with us. That's what he says. If you, if you will obey me, I will be with you. And you'll know it. And this is important for us, even as we pray about a new building, we can think, you know, we can think if only we had a better facilities, the church will grow if we had more music, if we had more programs, and we do need better facilities. But God reminds us here in this passage, right, that the most important thing is that God is with us. As a church, the most important thing is that God is with us. Our, our nothing will grow. You know, in Revelation chapter 2, the Lord Jesus speaks directly. I think it's the first example in the Bible of Jesus speaking directly to a church. And he speaks to the church at Ephesus. It was a big, successful, highly privileged church in the first century. And the Lord says, but I have this against you. That you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you are fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. It was maybe the, one of the first churches to grow really big, and maybe the, one of the first churches to disappear. The Lord threatens to remove their lampstand, the testimony, their witness, in the, the city of Ephesus. If they didn't repent, the Lord would move on, he says, and I'll raise up a new lampstand somewhere else. Because like Solomon, they had abandoned the love they had at first. If you read chapter 3 of 1 Kings, it says, Solomon loved the Lord. But he doesn't now. And this is the most important thing for us as a church, to maintain a heart of love for the Lord. <laughs> that's, what, that's the most crucial thing. Solomon's heart drifted and he lost his kingdom. And the essential thing is not buildings and facilities, it's love for God. And that's what will keep this church as a lampstand in this area. 
So Solomon's life ends on a diner. He died with the knowledge that all that he had built was about to be torn apart like a hedge's robe. And his son would lose 10 of the 12 tribes to this young man called Jeroboam. So how do we avoid our life ending on a diner? Well, Solomon himself tells us in Proverbs, which Solomon wrote, chapter 4, verse 23, he says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. He says, this is the key to life. Keep your heart with all vigilance. Maintain a careful check on what you love. It is a shame that Solomon didn't do the same thing. He let his heart drift. His loves shift. And it was his downfall. So he says, maintain a careful check on what you love. We have to ask ourselves this morning, has my heart drifted? Have I come to worship God even this morning just out of routine? Like Solomon going to the temple three times a year. With my mind and my heart far away, distracted, dwelling on other things, the things I really love. Sometimes it's inevitable that we are distracted, right? But we need to fight to keep our heart on the Lord. That's what this morning is about. That's why we come here. Now, how do we do that? Approximately 900 years after Solomon, our Lord Jesus himself, he picks up a little flower from the Judean hillside, and he says, consider the lilies. How they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not a red like one of these. He references Solomon. In all his glory, in his heyday. And in this same chapter of Luke's gospel, Jesus tells the parable of a rich fool who was making building plans about how he would spend his retirement eating and drinking, yet he died that very night. All his plans frustrated. And Jesus calls him a fool who laid up treasure for himself and was not rich towards God. And then our Lord goes on to tell us, this is what your priority should be in life. He says, and do not seek what you're to eat and what you're to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek. Is not, is not the theme for this year for us and absolutely seek? He says, instead, seek his kingdom. And these things will be added to you. He says, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Just like he offered it to Jeroboam. So Jesus says, sell your possessions, give to the needy, provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. It can't be taken from you. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. See that last phrase, there's the key. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. This is how to avoid losing what we have built up. Just like Solomon is losing his kingdom. If we invest in a kingdom that cannot be taken away. Solomon lost his kingdom because he lost control of his heart. He didn't keep it with all diligence. His heart went to, to what he was building up for himself on earth, and he lost it. But Jesus says, you, you, you invest in, in heaven, and you can't lose it. Build up treasure in heaven, because wherever your treasure is, there your heart will follow. You know, I think we Christians in the West need to develop a greater fear of nice things. Why would we be afraid of nice things? Because it was nice things that captured Solomon's heart. It was gold. It was beautiful horses. It was pretty women. He collected them all like treasure. And they turned his heart away from the Lord. And if we get a sense that, there, that we are collecting treasure on earth in any form, 
then Jesus says, sell, sell, sell your possessions, give to the needy. Just give it away. Do not let those things capture your heart. Sell them. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail. Invest in eternity. Do not lay up treasures on earth, whatever you do, because your heart will go there. Seek to be rich towards God. Seek God's rule in our own hearts, in our family, in others. Invest your prayers, your time, your money, your energy, your life, your whole life in God's kingdom. And your heart will follow. It will go there. Wherever you invest, your heart will follow. So this is a scary chapter, isn't it? It records the shameful end of Solomon's glorious life. In his younger days, he genuinely loved the Lord. It tells us in chapter 3. And yet now we see him die a fool with God working against him. The Lord had warned him, yet he went ahead anyway. Gathered up all his treasures on earth. And our Lord warns us of the same danger of collecting too many lesser glories because then we'll lose sight of the greater glory. And he tells us, so the, our Lord tells us to sell them, to give away much of what we have in order to invest in the eternal kingdom, give our time, our prayers, our money towards God's people, towards mission, towards the, the furtherance of the gospel. We start building a, a, a large bank account in heaven because that will stop our heart drifting anywhere. That will fix it firmly on the future that is secure, that we can't miss out on, that can never be taken away. And we need to have no fear, little flock, because it will be God's delight to give us the kingdom. A kingdom that will be far more glorious than Solomon's forever. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you for, for the warning of your word. It, it, we do need it in our society, especially when there are so many nice things that we come across every day. It's so easy to begin collecting them, just as Solomon began collecting many, many nice things. Lord, but it takes our heart. It has an impact on our life. So we pray your protection, Lord. We pray you would help us to come here every week, not just out of routine, but to genuinely worship your Son with our whole hearts, that he might draw out our hearts after him and what he has done for us, that we might lay our lives at his feet and that we might invest in his kingdom. Invest our time, our prayers, our energy, our money, our whole lives in seeking his rule within our own hearts and within the hearts of our family, our friends, our loved ones, within our, our Belfast and the surrounding area, Lord, that we might seek God's kingdom to rule. Lord, that we might invest in it, not in our own kingdom, because it can never be taken away from us. We will know his, we will, know, we, will, we will be given it forever. Lord, it will be the Father's good delight to give us the kingdom, the kingdom that we have worked for and invested in. Lord, we do just pray for help to see this more and more and to obey it. Lord, sometimes we do know these things, but we find them hard to do. So we pray for this help in Jesus' name. Amen.